And now, we welcome you back to Third Phase of Moon Radio. I'm your host, Dr. J. Andy Elias, and we have an amazing show for you today. Blake, how you doing today? Doing good, Dr. Jane. We're uh, looking forward to ask the questions to Dr. Stephen Greer. That's correct. Today. And Dr. Hello, Greer. Dr. Greer. How are you, Dr. Greer? I'm doing great, thank you. you no, know, as we are approaching 120,000 subscribers, 80 million total views, Dr. Stephen Greer has been the pioneer in the disclosure movement. First with the disclosure hearings that you held back in, was it 2001, I believe, Dr. Greer? Yeah, 12 years ago, Disclosure Project, uh, and we still have, still have all that in the entire um, National Press Club event, which was seen by over 800 million people is still can be seen at uh, seriousdisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S, disclosure.com. And, and actually, that's what led to now about uh, 25 uh, countries around the world opening up their UFO files. And we now have 110 uh, top secret military and uh, intelligence and corporate witnesses uh, to UFO secrecy that have come forward that we have on digital videotape. So it's, you know, it's become this enormous movement worldwide that, uh, uh, of course, the United States government, it just denies any of this exists, but there are other, co- other countries that are becoming quite honest about it. You know, Dr. Sinclair, welcome out to Third Phase of Moon again. This is Blake Cousins. I, I wanted to ask you, before we get to questions about what you've been working on, you know, Scott Carpenter, famous astronaut, just died. And he was claiming that when he was on a mission to outer space in his, uh, you know, short orbit around the Earth, that he was never alone in outer space. Did you ever have the privilege to meet Mr. Carpenter? No, but I knew Gordon Cooper, who, of course, as you know, was one of the uh, really heroes of the space program. And his testimony is actually <clears throat> up on our site also. And uh, astronaut Cooper, uh, actually, his team filmed a landing, uh, landed uh, extraterrestrial uh, spacecraft at uh, a dry lake bed in, uh, near Edwards Air Force Base in 1956. And interestingly, it was uh, he actually looked at the film after it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, treated and produced, and he was ordered to put it on a general's plane and fly it back to the Pentagon. And it went into the black pit of Calcutta. And years later, when uh, President Clinton uh, was president, and of course I was briefing the president's people and the CIA director on all these uh, issues, um, he uh, and I met, we were given a talk at the Federalist Society in Washington, and he told me that he had given all this detailed, uh, what's called actionable intelligence to the Secretary of Defense at the time. It was uh, Secretary of Defense Cohen. And Cohen looked into this, and basically all that uh, evidence, which was a clear daylight sighting and what have you, this being reported by one of the great heroes of our space program, had just simply, quote, vanished. And, of course, it didn't vanish. It's in a black project, uh, and it's been kept secret. So, uh, so there are so many astronauts I do know, like astronaut Ed Mitchell, who I brought to the Pentagon when I was briefing the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and, and many others. And... Um, you know, people on my team who are who are close friends with Buzz Aldrin and, and Neil Armstrong, who's since passed away about a year and a half ago, um, you know, told me that when we landed on the moon, uh, that in fact there were extraterrestrial vehicles on the edge of the crater above the Sea of Tranquility. And um, I've had family members of, of both Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong confirm that to me. But uh, when we invited Neil Armstrong to come to these uh, briefings and meetings we had up on Capitol Hill and at the Pentagon and for members of Congress, uh, you know, he told us that if he were to discuss this, um, that he was told that uh, they would kill his uh, wife, his children, and his grandchildren, and that as much as he supported what we were trying to do, he simply couldn't talk about it. So unfortunately, he took that to his grave in terms of, of, of coming out on the issue publicly, but of course we have friends of his as well as uh, family members and friends of Buzz Aldrin who have confirmed this. So this is not just, uh, you know, a distant issue. I mean, I, I personally have met with enough people that I'm certain that we have had these kinds of uh, astronauts who've seen things, but they're simply not allowed to talk about it. You know, like you said, Gordon Cooper, Edgar Mitchell, we actually just spoke to him today, and again, he confirmed that uh, there's a cabal going on that's controlling everything. And I actually want to switch gears to what you're currently doing. You coined the term CE5, which is human-initiated contact, and you have led a global disclosure by teaching people to contact. And and there was a recent story 
about right. a movie producer, right? That saw a real ET cat, but then a fake one with rivets. Can you talk about that in false flags? Yeah, well, this is, of course, what, what most people in the, who follow this subject don't know about, that they need to know about, and it's very critical. Uh, my whole involvement of this uh, started, uh, well, when I was eight or nine and had a very close daytime sighting. But uh, in 1990, I founded uh, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, CSETI. And that led to the disclosure project because what I was doing was training people to go out under the stars and become citizen diplomats to make contact with these interstellar visitors. Um, I had concluded that they certainly were not hostile, although there was a lot of false information out there about that. And once we had contact uh, in Florida, in Belgium, in Mexico, uh, that's when I was invited to go up and brief the director of the CIA. Um, so the disclosure project and the briefings I got involved in were a direct outgrowth of us having made confirmed contact, and they knew it. The intelligence community knew it. Now, eventually, the head of Army Intelligence turned to me and says, you know, you figured out the Rosetta Stone of how to make contact. And I said, yes, because you're dealing with the technologies that are going faster than the speed of light. When you go beyond the speed of light, you're crossing into other dimensions. Those dimensions are very intimately related to what I call coherent thought and non-local consciousness. And it gets into that whole nexus of where consciousness and non-locality of mind and thought interfaces with the magnetic and electromagnetic field. And this is really the cutting edge of the science that I'm involved with, as well as the free energy technologies. But this area is, is the area that, uh, ironically, is least known about in the UFO subculture. What's mostly heard about are the false flag events that have happened and the counterintelligence operations and what they really wanted to do. And, of course, uh, Carol Rosen, who was Werner Von Braun's uh, assistant for a number of years, um, who is one of our disclosure project witnesses and, and who... For those who don't know who Werner von Braun was, he invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler and then became part of our space program in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And, and uh, after the World War II ended in 1945, we brought him on under Operation Paperclip. But, but Carol Rosen said that on his deathbed, he begged Carol uh, Rosen to be, spread the word that there was an attempt underway to stage a false flag, kind of hoaxing of a threat, an alien threat out in space, and that it was all a hoax, uh, and that basically we would go from the Cold War to global terrorism, which at that time in, in the 70s when she learned this wasn't that big of an issue, to eventually this sort of threat from outer space, which is completely concocted. And, you know, the point I make in the film, a serious um, uh, which again is spelled S-I-R-I-U-S, um, like Sirius XM. Uh, that movie has a little bit of this in there, but of course in an hour and 50 minutes you can't cover too much. But it, it opens the door to the fact that we people need to question you know, all these fearsome movies and things that have been done uh, and things on the Internet that seem to scare the hell out of people. Why is that being done? Well, if, as Leon Panetta, the CIA director that I put the, the briefing together for when Obama became president, um, who was CIA director before he was Secretary of Defense, is, was correct that we were spending $110 billion a year chasing 70 al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. Well, how do you grow a $1 trillion military-industrial complex to a 2 or 3 or $4 trillion program without a large existential threat? Now that the Cold War is over, well, you've got to start seeding the population with fear and propaganda about a threat from outer space. And so I think the way around that is to spread, put light on the fact that this is all a hoax. There is obviously no hostile intent, or, or we'd know about it. It would have been over in 1945 when we detonated the first atomic bomb. But also to train people to become citizen ambassadors to these visitors using these advanced concepts of contact, advanced consciousness, coherent thought, and what have you. And this is something which the intelligence community now can't contain because you know what? We have a contact app that there's a connection at SiriusDisclosure.com. That's S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com where you can download, if you have a smartphone, Android or, or iPhone, a whole contact app that has the meditation techniques, the remote viewing techniques, the electronic tones we send out. It turns your phone into a magnetic field detector if there's an ET craft that's approaching. 
all of this is there on this app, and anyone in the world can have it. So now we have thousands of people all over the world doing this, and the intelligence community can't keep up with all that. They can keep up with me, but they can't keep up with all of that. And what we're getting is reports from all over the world of people who are having amazing contact experiences, and we're basically bypassing the, the, this sort of log jam with these corrupt governments around the world. And so I say, look, you know, it's power to the people. Let the people learn to do this. And my goal when I started on this endeavor, you know, I'm an emergency doctor, and in medicine, we have a saying, you know, you see one, you do one, you teach one. So once you see it, you learn it yourself, and then you teach it to someone else. My goal in all of this has been to, to share this in such a way that if I were to drop dead tomorrow, it wouldn't matter because, you know, the knowledge is out there, and I'd become sort of irrelevant in that sense. Um, so my whole purpose is always to make myself unnecessary. And same thing with the Disclosure Project. That's why we launched this, and it's now going around the world. I just got back from uh, Australia, an island off the coast of Australia, where I was meeting with over 120 world leaders, and I was the keynote presenting this information to them because there are people now all over the world saying, what in the world's going on? And so I think that this is really exciting, and I think that the more that we – realize that it's the people, we the people, who have to engage in contact and have to engage in disclosure. And also, we're ultimately going to have to be responsible for bringing out these advanced free energy technologies that can get us off fossil fuels and nuclear power. But that's really up to us. Don't sit around waiting for the White House and Congress to do anything. I mean, my God, they can't even agree on a budget. So, you know, I think we really have to begin to, to realize that the, we have to empower people to do these really critical uh, things that are going to bring us into a good future.